one of the most well-known names in history is Napoleon Bonaparte. Despite this, it feels as though few people know the extent of his rule and of his rise to power. Napoleon's rule of France in the early 1800s led to a great war, arguably at a worldwide scale. His rule led to fighting across Europe and fledgling America as well as in Egypt. At his peak, Napoleon had expanded his empire across Europe, becoming Emperor of the French, King of Italy, as well as King of Spain, before later putting his brother on the Spanish throne in his place. The Emperor's takeover led to revolution in French and Spanish colonies in Latin and South America, such as in Haiti. At his coronation in 1804, he placed the crown on his head himself to solidify his autocracy. He was indebted to no one. But before he could command Europe and many of her colonies, Napoleon was a nobody who had to rise to power. In 1789, prior to Napoleon's rule, France was a monarchy, as it had been forever. After years of famine, economic downturn, and poor government decisions, the people revolted. France erupted into chaos, and the king, Louis XVI, and his queen, Marie Antoinette, were both jailed. The lack of proper leadership by councils and committees led to further chaos, with the reign of terror bringing the guillotine over the heads of tens of thousands, with the king being guillotined himself in 1793, and France's figureheads of the terror meeting that same fate, France had no leader. A nation normally ruled by a monarch and nobles, left singed by revolution and bloodshed, allowed for a military general to gain popularity. The chaos led Europe to turn against France following the revolution, as many of the monarchs in Europe were not very fond of the idea of also having their heads guillotined off. And so they vied to stop the revolution from spreading beyond France. This war that broke out in the 1790s allowed for Napoleon to gain fame, defeating foreign adversaries in battle. Quote, it was the French Revolution that made the stupefying ascent possible. The revolution had badly damaged the traditional hierarchies of French society, opening the door to radically new forms of social mobility and political power. It also unleashed newly intense forms of war. In 1798, Napoleon would take his war to Egypt. After earning fame in France as a general, repelling Prussian forces, he sailed off to historic Egypt to claim more fame. Sailing away from his successes in Italy and in the island of Malta, he crossed the Mediterranean Sea in the direction toward the Cradle of Civilization. While Egypt at this time was still a legendary, historic area, Europe back then knew little of Egypt's extensive ancient history, little of the pyramids and the Sphinx. Egypt presented major geographic advantage, housing the Suez Canal. This canal would allow transport by boat from the Mediterranean Sea into Asia, rather than having to boat all the way around the southern tip of Africa. Napoleon knew if he could secure a canal under a French stronghold, he could gain major advantages in war, as well as in trade. Egypt long ago had been in both the Greek and Roman empires. Napoleon compared himself to great generals of those ancient times, like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar especially. You would say he was an heir to the ancient Romans. I am of the race that founds empires, he once boasted. On July 21st, 1798, Napoleon brings his army toward Cairo. Stopped by the Ottoman army in Egypt, he is forced to fight while he still needs to cross the Nile River. Napoleon personally named this battle the Battle of the Pyramids, for the Great Pyramid of Giza, visible during the battle. The location of the event has allowed for great paintings to be produced, depicting the pyramids as a background to Napoleon's army. Napoleon's advanced battle strategy and better equipped army allowed him to easily win. Quote, the combat had lasted more than two hours, but two hours of indescribable horror. Throughout the battle, many of the Ottoman Mamluks retreated back across the Nile River toward Cairo, leading to mass confusion among themselves as the French army tore through the untrained soldiers. After crushing the local forces, Napoleon was free to head to Cairo. While revolution was attempted by the citizens of the city as they tried to remove their foreign occupiers, Napoleon easily held the city under little threat. That all changed, however, on August 1st, when the British attacked Napoleon's fleet less than two weeks after Napoleon's victory at the pyramids. After days of searching, British Admiral Horatio Nelson 
caught up to Napoleon's fleet, harbored at Aboukir Bay in defensive position. The French flagship, the Orient, was docked in the middle of Napoleon's fleet. It's worth noting that Napoleon was not present for this battle, as he was not with his ships when the British decided to strike. Nelson would gain much fame for his success at this battle, as well as in future ones for his naval genius. Noticing that the French had left enough room toward the shore to squeeze in, Nelson was able to surround the French fleet and fire upon them from both sides. The battle saw the epic explosion of the Orient after the British had fired upon it. Quote, when the Orient exploded, the bodies of many hundreds of men were blasted into the heavens above Aboukir Bay. The battle was a devastating success for Nelson and the British, leaving Napoleon and his army stranded in Egypt with no fleet to return home with. On his voyage to Egypt, Napoleon did not bring only soldiers. He brought with him his army of military as well as an army of scientists. Napoleon was genuinely interested in higher learning, especially scientific and quasi-philosophical topics. He often seemed more at home amongst his leading savants than he did amongst his generals. With his legion of scientists in tow, Napoleon would found the Institute of Egypt for scientific research and discoveries in the region. The institute was created in August 1798, just 10 days after Napoleon's fleet had been destroyed at the Nile. Later, in July of 1799, Napoleon's scientists at the institute made a major scientific discovery. The Rosetta Stone, as it would come to be known, was discovered, which had instructions for translating ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics into Greek. This allowed for scientists to study the ancient language and understand the written text on pyramid walls and other ancient remains. Napoleon's scientists originally discovered much of what we understand about ancient Egypt today. It was Napoleon's expedition and his scientists which began modern Egyptology, the study of ancient Egypt. As time went on though, Napoleon's army in Egypt crumbled. He had lost many men and lots of resources when the British obliterated his fleet at the Battle of the Nile. As the French struggled through the scorching hot desert, the plague spread among them. With few hospitals in the area, many men died during Napoleon's campaign in Egypt. A year of failed battles throughout Egypt and Syria led to the breaking point of the army. Fearing he would have to surrender to the British, Napoleon decided to abandon his army in Egypt and set sail for France. He took an unarmed boat back home, but was not attacked during the voyage. When Napoleon returned to France, he took part in the staging of a coup against the government, becoming first consul in November 1799. By December of 1804, Napoleon would be crowned Emperor of France. By 1802, the British and Ottoman combined forces were able to easily crush the weakened and abandoned French remaining in Egypt. With the defeat, the remaining Frenchmen surrendered everything they had gained during the conquest, including the Rosetta Stone. The artifact was moved to the British Museum in London, where it remains to this day. Napoleon's campaign in Egypt was largely a failure. Napoleon's scientists had founded modern Egyptology, but most of their achievements would end up being taken over by the British, though it is likely that the British would not have plundered the Rosetta Stone or began studying Egyptology if it wasn't for Napoleon leading them there in the first place. Despite Napoleon's failures in Egypt, he was still able to continue amassing power in France, becoming emperor. Perhaps Napoleon's campaign in Egypt is a dress rehearsal for his demise in the Napoleonic Wars, able to win some fantastic victories, but ultimately losing after years of attrition. Similar events would take place when Napoleon would unsuccessfully invade Russia and when his reign was finished in Waterloo in 1815. Ultimately, Napoleon's campaign would severely impact Egyptian and Ottoman people negatively, with Western intrigue into the area increasing massively following French discoveries. Over the next 200 years, scientists would study the pyramids and Egyptian history at the expense of the native peoples of the area. Napoleon headed to Egypt out of vanity, expecting to be able to build an empire as the Greeks and Romans had in history. The campaign was a mess that could have easily ended Napoleon's career if he hadn't jumped ship and ran from his mistakes.